Good morning. Welcome to part four of our study of the book of Habakkuk. We are here at the Bible study table this morning, ready to take finish the last part of this amazing book. Who knew that uh, this small and what we think insignificant book in uh, the back of the Old Testament actually has so much application to us today? I just want to kind of take you on a little review uh, back through Habakkuk before we jump into chapter 3. Remember that Habakkuk, the prophet, began his book by looking at the sin that was all around him in the land. If you don't remember that, you can just pause, go back to part 1, uh, check it out. Because in part 1 we talked about all of the sin that was happening in the land at the time. We looked at the kings and how they brought idol worship into the nation. But uh, here, uh, Habakkuk, he went first, he looked at the sin of his country. Then he heard God in chapter, actually the second part of chapter 1, uh, God was telling him that the Chaldeans were coming to destroy his nation. And Habakkuk asked God, says, God, how can you let your enemies destroy your people? But then God gives him an answer and he tells him how that the Chaldeans are also going to be judged. Okay? And uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, Habakkuk climbs up onto the watchtower. He wants to see what God is going to do in response to his questions. Well, God showed him in chapter 2 that he was going to judge those Babylonians. Now, Habakkuk climbs out of the depths of despair to worship on the mountaintop because he has seen the goodness of God. And, you know, we need to remember that in all times, we need to see God's goodness. We can do this by understanding His character. True worship comes from understanding God's character. Uh, we understand that character by studying God's Word. Now, I know today, a lot of worship emphasizes feelings. Um, they emphasize music. But what's the result? Um, worship that emphasizes feelings and music doesn't give us a great understanding of God, and it results in a very weak Christianity. Instead, we should be opening up God's Word and studying His Word. Now, as we look at what Habakkuk does here, we look at what does it take in our own life to go from the valley of depression to the heights of worship in our life. Well, here in Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk starts out with prayer. What is he praying for? He is praying for God to work in the middle of his nation. Let's look first of all at that prayer that Habakkuk made. It is a very special prayer. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 says, a, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigianoth. All right, now we get a, a word there uh, that simply means a, a lament or a sad song. Okay, so this chapter is actually a song. This, would, this part of Habakkuk would fit very well uh, into the book of Psalms because we have this sad song here that Habakkuk is singing about his people and about the enemies of God. And really think about, what did Habakkuk see? Habakkuk saw the sin of his people and um, he was told that his nation was going to be destroyed. And then he was told that the nation destroying his nation was going to be destroyed. So um, as he sat there in Jerusalem, just he was thinking about that city. And it must have been hard for him to comprehend. What would it be like to see his entire city totally destroyed? Well, what about you? Have you ever been in a situation where everything seemed bad? Um, maybe... You even turn to God's people and things got worse. You know, you need to do the same as Habakkuk. It's, it's okay to lament sin. It's okay to feel sorry for sin. In fact, I was listening to the radio this week and a, a lady on the radio was talking about um, the sin of domestic abuse. And, and she said, you know what, it is okay to lament and to be sad about physical domestic abuse because sin is sad. And we don't spend enough time crying over the sins that are taking place. And I think here we see the same thing from Habakkuk. He cries over the sins of God's people, the sins of God's enemies, but then he turns to God. And that's really the key. And, you know, 
Habakkuk not only prays this sad song, but as he hears God's message, he is afraid. Look at verse 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, receive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. You know, here in verse 2, Habakkuk is praying to God. He hears God's word and he was afraid. What did he hear? Well, go back to chapter 1, and you can see exactly what Habakkuk heard. He heard that his people were going to be destroyed, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and then the Babylonians were going to be destroyed. He hears destruction, destruction, destruction. That should make you afraid, and that's the way Habakkuk was. But Habakkuk is not just afraid, but he's praying to God. In, in the middle of verse 2, he says, O Lord, revive thy work. In the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. He is asking. He is praying for revival in his country. Saying God. In the middle of destroying our people. Please revive. What you are doing. With my people. And I would encourage you. If you want to see. How did Habakkuk's prayer revival work out. Look at three different books of the Bible. Daniel talks about the revival that was taking place in people's hearts as they were in Babylon, at least in the heart of Daniel himself. And then as you look at the book of Ezra, you can see how people, God's people came back to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple and people are weeping because they're able to worship God again and they're excited for once about worshiping God. And then you can read the book of Nehemiah. It's about the revival of worship in the city. When ne Habakkuk here is praying for that revival. And he's going to see it. Actually Habakkuk's not going to see it. But we see it in God's word. That Habakkuk's prayer uh, came true. And he also says. In the midst of years make known. He is praying. That people will know. That God is at work. And I would encourage you. He's praying that people will know that God is at work. But you read Daniel chapter 4. And you see King Nebuchadnezzar praying to God and crying out to God. People knew that God was at work in the midst of the situation. Daniel chapter 5 as well. Uh, King Belteshazzar is seeing God's hand being written on the wall. And uh, he's seeing God at work. But in the middle of asking God to work, Habakkuk also asked God one last thing. He begs for God's mercy. At the very last part of verse 2, it says in wrath, remember mercy and you know throughout the scriptures we see God's judgment but God's judgment is also always mingled with God's mercy God is merciful that is a part of his character when we say that God is merciful what do we mean it means that God does not give us what we deserve that is a very important thing for us to understand in the midst of difficulty in the middle of hardship uh, when things are not going our way, we need to remember that we deserve the punishment of death and we deserve hell because of our sin. And a lot of people lose sight of that fact. In fact, in our country here in America, we talk about what we deserve and we talk about our rights and we talk about the things that we should have as a normal American. But if you look at God's word, uh, judgment is what we deserve because of our sin. We deserve the punishment in hell, and it's only because of God's mercy that we aren't experiencing those things. And Habakkuk here is asking God in wrath, remember mercy. Now, as we move to the middle part of this book, verses 3 through 15, we're going to see a vision. And that is Habakkuk takes the time to ponder the greatness of God. And uh, as you go through this section, there are lots of woes w-o-e okay and uh, if you're a horse person like i am that's not the woe you're thinking about where we're trying to stop the horse instead woe is stop and think about what god has done and you know this this middle section if you think of it as a beautiful song it's really a song about the history of the nation of israel it's really a song about what god has done for his nation and uh, we start in verses 3 through 5 where we see that God came in splendor verse 3 says God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran Selah his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise and his brightness was as the light he had horns 
coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and the burning coals went forth at his feet. You know, here we see this beautiful picture of God. Now, we're given um, these locations, okay, in verse 3. Uh, we're given locations of Teman and uh, Mount Paran, okay? Those are simply referring to areas near the nation of Egypt. And those locations are telling us that God brought his people out of Egypt. In the middle of the verse, we get to the word sila. That simply means stop and think. If you are a musical person, in music you rest to kind of meditate on the music that you've already seen, or I'm sorry, already heard. Uh, similar here is that we're stopping and thinking about God's power. And we're reminded here in this passage that God's holiness, I'm sorry, God's glory is seen throughout all of the earth. Now, I do want to draw your attention to some interesting voice, uh, words here. Because verse 4 says, And his brightness was as the, as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Uh, verse 4 is really telling us that God's glory is throughout all of the earth, but we cannot totally see all of God's glory. And as a result, God used light to hide all of his glory. Kind of like here on this earth during the day, there's all of these stars up in the sky, but we can't see them. Why? Because they're hidden by the sun. And uh, so the sun is so bright we can't see them. And you know what? God has kind of shielded his glory with light, which really is a picture of how God, how powerful God is, in that his holiness has to be hidden by light. And he did show his power in small glimpses, okay? Uh, verse 4 talks about, says, uh, he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Just imagine that uh, you have God's hand surrounding his glory, and there's things coming out of there, okay? Now, the word here we have used is the word horns, all right? But it's really not talking about horns. Instead, it's talking about the bolts of lightning that are striking the earth, and they're revealing to us God's power. But they're just a small sampling of God's power. Now, um, here in central Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, eastern Pennsylvania, we don't get a whole lot of really powerful lightning storms where you can see lightning a long distance away. I remember uh, one time when I was in northern Wisconsin at college, I was out working on the campus, and I was in a backfield and uh, I was in the middle of a lightning storm, and the lightning bolts were striking all around me. It was very vivid. You could see uh, the bolts of lightning coming down. But, uh, you know, that's just a small sample of what God's power really is. And where was that power shown? It was shown uh, in this section to those in Egypt. Uh, if you want to go back and look at Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 12, you can see how God showed his power. To the people of Egypt, why? So God's people could be brought out of that land. And you know, um, the, the exit from Egypt is always a sign of God's deliverance from sin. And you know, as we sit here and we think about looking at this passage, about how powerfully God went into Egypt, he showed himself strong, and he brought his people out. What about in your own life? Um, has God delivered you from the power of sin i know a lot of times we like to hear uh these great testimonies about people who were controlled by the power of sin maybe it was it was drugs or alcohol and you know god saved them and brought them out of it but even a five-year-old child who is saved from their sin god is powerfully working to bring them to a point of salvation you know as a believer, we should be thankful for God's deliverance. So here we see that he came in power. Verses 6 and 7 tell us that he stood in power. Verse 6 says, he stood, he measured the earth, he beheld, and he drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered, and perpetual hills did bow. At his ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Uh, to measure something there in verse 6 uh, means it shows that you uh, possess it. And if you begin to think about uh, Exodus chapter 12, God's people come out of Egypt. God moves them into the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, 
And um, here we have a, a picture that the, it says that the mountains were scattered and uh, the mountains are shaking when God brought his people to Mount Sinai. The mountain shook and the people could feel that they weren't allowed up on the mountain because God's presence was there. But the mountain was shaking to help remind the people that God was there and he was very powerful. And what did God do for his people? He scattered the nations in front of them. It's just what's being talked about here. Um, when we have those, those words, the tents of Kushan and Midian, that refers to the nations that would oppose Israel as they approach the promised land. And uh, you can read, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 23, about the different nations opposing God's people, and God scatters them, and he brings them directly to the place that they need to be. And then... We see God marching on to victory. Uh, and we see that in verses 8 through 15. You know, here we see very poetic descriptions of all the battles that God has won. And um, here in this prayer, what is Habakkuk doing? He's reminding God's people that God has done a great work in the past. Now, some of these are very obvious, okay? And some of them you have to use your imagination. And, you know, it's okay. I would encourage you on your own to read through verses 8 through 15 and then go back to the Old Testament. Go back to Joshua. Go back to Judges and compare these two passages. And you can pick out and say, oh, what is described here is what is being sung about here in this song. Habakkuk has a very specific purpose. What he's trying to do to get God's people to think about what God has done in the past for that for him for them sorry verse 8 uh, verse 8 says was the Lord displeased against the rivers was thine anger against the rivers was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst drive out thine horses and thy chariots of salvation now talking about rivers and sea now if you think about the nation of Israel and you go to the book of Exodus and you think about them in the sea I hope you're thinking about the Red Sea, right? In fact, uh, this uh, week, uh, as we did our uh, Wednesday night devotional, uh, my son Josh challenged people uh, to let us know what places in the Bible they would like to go. And, and someone texted us and said, uh, I would love to walk through the Red Sea. And uh, that's what's being described here in verse 8. God brought his people to the Red Sea. And uh, behind them, the nation of Egypt, the armies of Egypt are coming. And God opened up the Red Sea and allowed his people to walk through that sea unharmed. Once they got to the other side, the Egyptians ran down into the Red Sea. And what happened? They were destroyed as that sea closed on top of them. In fact, if you read in the book of Exodus, Exodus you read the account, it says that the wheels of their chariots began to fall off before the ocean stopped. So they already knew that God was at work and uh, now all of a sudden the sea closed on them and God brought his people through in salvation. And that's what we have here pictured in verse 8. Uh, verse 9 says, Thy bow was made quite naked according to the O's of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Now, verse 9 uh, might sound very confusing to you if you're not thinking the right way. If you think from a military standpoint, you understand this verse. The bow, what is a bow? Okay, it's, Sorry, ladies, it's not the thing you wear in your hair. Okay, uh, The bow is talking about, we would say, bow and arrow. All right, And uh, the bow was made quite naked, simply is referring to God took his bow out of its case, he put a string on it, and he prepared to use it in battle, okay? And now, you sit there and say, okay, what battle did God use his bow in? We're not told, okay? Uh, but you know, as we read about God's people going into the land in the book of Joshua, we see battle after battle after battle where the people really didn't fight. God was the one that delivered them, and God was the one that protected them as they were trying to fight throughout the book of Joshua. God's bow was seen, okay? And uh, another example of God's power is it says, Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers, okay? Even this past week, we had a lot of rain. And uh, I always enjoy when we get a lot of rain going by creeks and streams and rivers and just seeing them uh, and, and seeing all of the the water coming down and the, and the dirt being ripped away. And it's just an example of God's 
power, okay, and how strong it is. And God is working here in power to protect his people. Verse 10, it says, The mountain saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. Now, interesting, verse, chapter, verse 10 is talking about God using water to defeat the enemy. I know we already got one example, the Red Sea. God used water to defeat the enemy. But uh, I would challenge you to go read Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5. Because uh, in Judges 4 and 5, there is a, um, a, a judge who is a lady. Her name is Deborah. And uh, she goes to a man by the name of Barak and says, Barak, you need to go and fight God's battle. And uh, Barak says, well, if you go with me, I will go. And Deborah says, well, you know what? If I go with you, you're not going to receive credit for the fight. And, you know, normally that's kind of where we leave it. But if you continue reading Judges chapter 4, God actually sends rivers and streams and rain and storms to defeat the enemy there in Judges chapter 4. And then Judges chapter 5 is a beautiful song, uh, just praising God for the way that he delivered his people. And uh, we think that's what's being talked about here in chapter 10. I'm sorry, in verse 10, where God used the mountains and the water to defeat his enemy. And he lifted up his hands on high. Verse 11 says, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Okay, so in verse 11, God made the sun and the moon to stand still. Now, you Sunday school teachers should have this one down, know exactly where this comes from, okay? Because in Joshua chapter 10, 11, and 12, I'm sorry, I think that's Joshua chapter 10, verses uh, 12 and 13, God, uh, Joshua is asking for help. He's trying to destroy God's enemies and God stops the sun and moon so that the, his people can defeat the enemy. God made the sun and the moon stand still. Now, I know we sit here and we say, how did that happen? You know, obviously somehow God stopped the rotation of the earth. We're not sure how it happened, okay? But we do know that God, we have it recorded in scripture, that God worked a miracle so that his people could destroy the enemy. And here Habakkuk is praising God for helping them defeat their enemy. Verse 12 says, Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Okay? And, uh, you know, we get this, this another picture as God is coming in and he is defeating the enemy. It says he is, was thresh the heathen in anger. Okay? You kids out there would love this picture. All right? Because... Uh, if you know what a nunchuck is, nunchucks were originally threshing tools. The Japanese would use them. Threshing is simply when you take the stalk of grain and you beat it with a flail to get that uh, grain off. Okay, And uh, so the Japanese took those flails and eventually they turned them into a weapon called a nunchuck. But it's very vivid because uh, the threshing is constantly beating. And as you beat the stalk, the grain is falling off that stalk of grain. You know what, here's the picture, is God went through the nation, uh, the promised land. There was no enemy that could stand in front of God. He was threshing them out. They were falling down in front of him. And, you know, verses 13 through 15 shows us that God provided salvation for his people. Verse 13 says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked, by discovering the foundation unto the neck, Selah. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of the villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. Now, I want you to be careful as you read about this, okay? Um, because verse 13 says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, Okay? even for the salvation of thine anointed. All right, this book is being written to the nation of Israel. It's given to them to remind them how God is going to continue to take care of them, to remind them about God's salvation and protection for them in the past. But I think as we read this song, we are reminded of God's salvation for us, what God has done for us. And you know, um, what has God done for us? You know what? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to this earth 
to die for our sin. Why? <laughs> because he loved us, because he cared for us. But Jesus didn't stay dead. God reached into the tomb and brought him back to life uh, to show that he had paid the punishment for sin. And uh, with his death, and you know, as we kind of contemplate verse 13, it says, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people. Think about all that God did to save us. He has done great things for us. You know, it's important for us. When we are in the middle of difficulty, hardship, and trial, we need to think back to our salvation and what God did for us. He set a plan in motion before the foundations of this world. He loved us enough to send his only son down to earth who lived a perfect life, who died according to God's plan and who rose again. Why? So that we can be saved. What a great thing for us to think about. You know what? When we are in the middle of difficulties, hardships, when we're like Habakkuk and we're, we're in this valley of depression, a lot of times we forget what God has done for us in salvation. And maybe we need to stop and just contemplate our salvation. Stop and think about what God has done for us and how he has saved us and how he has gained the victory over sin for us. And you know, you can look at the rest of verses 14 and you can look at verse 15 and you can try and match them up with other battles that God won for his people. But you know, in, as we go through difficulties and hardships in our life, we need to focus on God's character. And that is going to cause us to respond in a right way to God. Now, you're going to have to jump to part two of this final lesson on Habakkuk to see the great response from Habakkuk at the end of this chapter. Welcome back to part two of our final study uh, on the book of Habakkuk. Uh, in part one, we saw Habakkuk afraid in verse 2 and then in verses 3 through 15 we saw Habakkuk singing a song of praise uh, to God but uh, now we're going to look at faith and uh, we look at Habakkuk affirming the will of God verses 6 through 19 uh, this is one of the greatest confessions of faith found anywhere in scripture Habakkuk has faced the frightening fact that his nation will be invaded by a merciless enemy the prophet knows that many of the people will go into exile and many will be slain. The land will be ruined in Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. Yet, he tells God that he will trust him no matter what happens. Listen to his confession of faith here in verses 6 uh, down through verse 19. Um, you know, verse 16, he tells God that he's just going to rest in the day of trouble. Uh, verse 16 says, when I heard... My belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble, when he cometh up unto the people. He will invade them with his troops. You know, in verse 16, we are reminded that Habakkuk is physically affected by all of the trouble that is about to fall on his people. And you can even see a list of things that he says. He says, you know, my belly trembled. My lips quivered, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled within myself. Now, these are all poetic expressions, okay? You can use them. You can try and figure out exactly what he's saying. Basically, he's saying, you know what? I was scared to death that I'm going to see the enemy. I'm going to see these Babylonians coming into my city. And, you know, I, I would just kind of challenge you to think, what would it be like? Because the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and they began to attack the city. I'm sure most of you listening have never been through as traumatic an experience as that would be. And Habakkuk is imagining what that day is going to be like, how awful, how horrible it is going to be. But he says in the middle of verse 16, I might rest in the day of trouble. I want you just to picture, here is the city of Jerusalem. The Babylonians are outside, they're battering rams, they're smashing against the wall. Um, the, uh, inside, the people are scrambling, uh, the moms are looking for food, the soldiers are running through the streets, they're manning the walls, um, and there's Habakkuk. What's he doing? He's swinging in a hammock. 
totally at rest in the middle of all the chaos. That is the picture that he is drawing here. Because why? Habakkuk is saying, you know what? In the midst of this chaos, I'm just going to choose to trust God. I'm not going to listen to my own fears. I'm not going to trust in my own feelings. Instead, I'm going to be still and I'm going to know that God is in control. And then Habakkuk goes on in verses 17 and 18 and say, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. Verse 17 Habakkuk draws a picture of now uh, Israel has been conquered. What does the land look like? Verse 17, he says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. The fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. You can just imagine as the Babylonians march away from Jerusalem. And history tells us, that they spent about two years uh, as an army in the area surrounding Jerusalem, destroy, eating all of the, the animals that were there, destroying all the, the fields, uh, wiping out the olive vineyards, and then eventually they conquer Jerusalem and they go away. What was it like to just walk around, around Jerusalem and in the Judean hillside? It would have been very barren, uh, very much destroyed. We get a beautiful picture of it here uh, from Habakkuk. He said the, the fig trees aren't blossoming. There's no fruit in the vines that's referring to the grapes, no grapes growing. Um, the labor of the olive trees shall fail. There's no olive oil. Uh, the fields, there's no crops in the fields anymore. And uh, there's no animals. They've all been captured, kidnapped. You know, the sheep have been slaughtered. The cows have been slaughtered. They've all been taken away. What a horrible destruction there must have been. And, you know, he's in the middle. He's picturing being in the middle of great, economic trouble but how is he going to respond he is going to respond with rejoicing now let me ask you a question how can you respond with a right attitude about god how can you respond with rejoicing when you are in the middle of what i don't know maybe economic hardship Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you're going through a relationship problem. Maybe you're having uh, difficulties with your children. Um, you know what? How are you going to do it? You're going to do it by looking to God's goodness. And look at verse 18. One of the key verses in this entire book. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He says, I will rejoice in the Lord. And if you look in your Bible, it should be a capital L-O-R-D. That is referring to Jehovah God. That is the proper name for God. And Habakkuk, by calling him by that name, he's acknowledging that God is in control of him. And God is not just in control of him, but all of the events that are surrounding his life. And he looks to God at, for his salvation. He is going to joy in God, the God of his salvation. You know, um, there are lots of people around the world that are in much worse circumstances than we here in America. I've had the privilege, I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about, traveling to northern Uganda and, and seeing people living in, in mud huts and uh, having thatched roofs. And yet still going to the little shack that they use as a church and worshiping God and singing joy to God. You know what? We as Americans think that our joy is tied to our economic situation. And uh, you know a lot of times we, we listen to the news, we listen to the radio, and we hear people talking about how much there's going to be chaos and problems and difficulties in America. You know what? All that might be true. But that doesn't mean we need to get rid of our joy. Because our joy should be based in God in his salvation that he offers and knowing that God is in control of all of the circumstances around us. That's how Habakkuk is able to rejoice in the middle of this chaos that's about to happen to him. He can rejoice because he knows that God is in control. And he's saying, I'm going to rejoice, God, because you are in control. And then verse 19, he says, the Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Now, uh, once again, we get some, some pictures here, okay? And, um, you know, H Habakkuk is saying that the Lord God is his strength. And it goes on to say that he will make his feet like hind's feet, okay? Now, 
Uh, for those of you that live in Pennsylvania, you know what hinds are, okay? They're deer. And uh, I know here in Bucks County, we have deer everywhere. Just the other day, I woke up and um, I looked out my window and there were deer in my yard. It was three does walking through the yard and they're just walking nice and calmly walking along. I thought, wow, you know, I can watch these, these deer for a while because they don't see me. I'm just looking out the window. There's nobody outside to bother them. And um, I got to a good spot where I could see them, and all of a sudden they just took off running really fast. And you know what? I don't think they were running for anything other than just the sheer joy of running. And that's what Habakkuk is saying here. He's saying, you know what? When I, I look at my own feelings and I feel what's going on inside, I'm totally depressed. I can't move. I can't do anything. But when I concentrate on God, he gives me that energy like those deer. And I can run and I can go wherever he wants me to go. And it's really Habakkuk is drawing the picture of he's climbing the mountain. He's getting closer to God. He's worshiping God. Why? Because he's resting in God's strength. And he says, he will make me to walk upon my high places. What are the high places? That's a picture of just walking with God. And worshiping God and being focused on God. You know, when Habakkuk started this book, he was down in the valley. He was wrestling with the will of God. Then he climbed higher and he stood on the watchtower, waiting for God to reply. After hearing God's word and seeing God's glory, he became like a deer, bounding confidently on the mountain heights. His circumstances hadn't changed, but he had changed. And now he was walking by faith instead of sight. He was living by promises, not explanations. You know, it isn't easy to climb higher in the life of faith. But who wants to live in the valley? Like Habakkuk, we must honestly talk to God about our difficulties. We must pray. We must meditate on God's word. and We must be willing to experience fear and trembling as the Lord reveals himself to us. But... It will, be worth, it will be worth it as we reach new summits for faith and discover new opportunities for growth and service. And how do we do that? You know, Habakkuk was given a, a, just an amazing, hard-to-take prophecy that his people were going to be destroyed. They were going to be wiped out. But you know what? Habakkuk, instead of focusing on the destruction to come, he focused on God's character and God's goodness. And he chose to rely on God no matter what. Well, what about you? What are the circumstances that you're going through? I don't know what the specific circumstances that you're going through are. But you know what? You can follow the same path as Habakkuk. You can choose to trust God. You can choose to rely on God no matter what. And you know what? God will put joy into your life as a result. Let's pray and let's close our study of Habakkuk by just thanking God and praising Him for how good He is to us. Dear Lord, we thank You. And for what you have done for us, we thank you so much for this challenge from this little book in the, the Minor Prophets. We thank you for its reminder that you are always in control, no matter what happens, no matter what difficulties we go through. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to trust you, to rest in you, to rely on you, uh, to be the one that is taking care of us in these difficult times. Lord, we thank you for the joy that we have in our life because of your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.